Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anissa. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Spark News team. We're so glad to have this webinar today on women in news and in the newsrooms. So this session is the second edition of a four-part webinar series on gender equality dedicated to journalists. Just for you to know, Spark News is a French-based social enterprise working with leading media across the world on changing the narratives on today's most pressing global issues. So just as you, you may have noticed that uh, and observed in your own newsrooms or else that despite an noticeable increase in the overall presence of women in the news over the years globally, women still only make up 24% of the persons featured in news. And when they do, they tend to be stereotyped or fall into gender categories. So as the public perception of gender equality roles in society is strongly influenced by the way media portray women and men, it is key that you journalists and media organizations find ways to ensure equally of the equal treatment between them. So fair enough. It can be easier said than done, I'm sure of that, which is what we're here today, to dig deeper together into concrete solutions and successful initiatives from all over the world and to exchange practical tools and insights for fairer representation. So please feel free along the next 90 minutes to ask your questions and perhaps also share media initiatives um, that you know on the chat and question section. You can also upvote the question you think are the most relevant. We want this webinar to be as full on interactive as possible. And I have Camille and Florent from the Spark News team to make sure that this really happens. So you've probably seen on the agenda that we have a lot of amazing speakers and experts today uh, joining us. So to dive directly into the topic, let's welcome on stage Nina Goswami. So Nina is the BBC Creative Diversity Lead for the 5050 Equality Project and News. The multi-award winning 5050 project is currently the biggest collective action on increasing women's representation at the BBC content there's ever been so far. Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you on board with us. Oh, well, thank you so much uh, for having me um, here today. I'm really, really grateful. Uh, for this opportunity to speak to everyone about what we do um, at the 5050 project. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so just before I leave the floor to you, I'm just going to remind everyone there's a chat and question section. Uh, and right after Nina's 10-minute uh, uh, presentation, we'll have five minutes of Q&A. So please feel free during the webinar uh, to ask your questions. Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so I've been asked to talk to you for 10 minutes. So um, hopefully I'll be able to give you some insights into what we do um, at the 5050 Project, which is about improving women's representation on content, but not just only at the BBC now, but across our partner network too. Um, and I'm really proud to say that that's the case. It now spans more than 70 organizations across 22 countries. And I hope at the end of this, some of you may want to join us too um, on our mission. Um, we're particularly excited at the moment because just last week, the BBC's new Director General, Tim Davey, made the first call to action to organizations outside the BBC to join us in what we call the 5050 Challenge Month. So this is when we publish our March data to the rest of the world to show how we're improving our representation when it comes to women. So now we want other organizations to join us too. And the reason that we kind of felt that it was the right time to do this um, was really because of the moment that we find ourselves in. With COVID, there's a feeling in some quarters that you know there are other priorities getting underrepresented voices heard just isn't one of them. I, on the other hand, believe that this is the moment that we have to ensure that voices are heard. Um, and that obviously includes women's voices, especially in this moment. You know, if you look at us as a media, if we're not representing all parts of society in a time of crisis, then how are we supposed to hold authorities to account? How are we supposed to ensure that our audiences understand what is frankly going on out there. And so we really do have a responsibility to hold ourselves to account. And that's what 5050 is really all about. Um, I, I wanna take us back a little bit to, to March this year. Um, and this idea of not prioritizing representation on our content was a real concern for us on the 5050 team. As I mentioned, 
March is our challenge month, the, the month that we put the data out there to the rest of the world. And um, obviously that was when most of the world went into lockdown this time round. Um, and 5050 is a voluntary initiative and we do that for, for a reason which I'll explain later. But as a, as a result of it being voluntary, would we find that our services within the BBC would see representation as a priority? You know, after all, we're just trying to stay on air at this point. But to our delight, most of them decided to continue monitoring their data. And two thirds of those teams reached 50% women contributors in their content. And what was even more staggering for us was that that was an increase of nine percentage points on the previous year's challenge. So for me, that's a real indicator that real culture change is taking place at the BBC. And well, it just makes me excited for the future and where we can take this. But let me first rewind uh, and go back to Christmas 2016 and when we actually started 5050. It all started with a car journey from London to Cornwall, which is in the southwest of England, and our outside source presenter, Ros Atkins. So Outside Source is a news programme that goes out on BBC World News globally and also on our domestic news channel. Ros was driving in his car, listening to a BBC radio station, and for a couple of hours, he didn't hear a single female voice. And he wondered to himself, how in this day and age could that be? So, as you do, he spent his Christmas thinking of a solution. And when he went back to his team in the new year, he asked if they would be the guinea pigs. He asked if they would monitor the content to count the number of men, number of women on their show and see if they could reach 50% women. And that was when 5050 was born, along with the core principles that remain the heart of this initiative today. So I'm going to use Outside Source as our example for today. Um, it's a daily program, as I mentioned. Um, and what we ask daily programs to do is reach 50% women over a month period. So they count the number of men, number of men, uh, number of men, number of women on their content every day. And it's the number of men and women that they control. And that is really important. And I'll explain that in a minute. But firstly, the reason why we set a period of time is because we want to allow for the ebb and flow of the news cycle. Obviously, one day might be male heavy, another day might be female heavy. And so we want to give our teams the opportunity to reach 50-50. Um, um, the reason why we make them count every day um, or every time they make content is because we want it to support their editorial decision making. If you don't know what your program looks like, how can you then adjust it to make it more representative of society. So in, say, a week, it might be at the end of that week, you've got 70% women, 30% men. So then you as a team can think, assess and adjust depending on whether it's right to do so for your programme or not. This is where the control element comes in. We ask our teams to, to count in terms of control in two different ways. Firstly, uh, we uh, remove from our monitoring anyone that we call a player and these are essentially people that are intrinsic to the storytelling of that news. So let's take Covid or Brexit um, in Britain. We would not count the British Prime Minister. We don't count Boris Johnson now and we didn't count Theresa May before him. The reason being is that we need them to tell the story. However, the expert contributors and commentators around them the case studies, the members of the public that we get on to speak about that, they all count. And everyone that counts, counts as one. We keep the stats as simple as possible in terms of the monitoring. We do have an overall golden rule, however. And that golden rule is that every contributor that takes part must be the best. And the reason for that is that 50-50 is not a quota system. It's a tool to help our teams make content as best as it can be. So that again brings in that voluntary element that I talked about earlier. We want our teams to want to make change and so that's really crucial to us as well. One of the things that uh, we noticed is 50-50 grew um, as it grew, it went from that one team outside source to, um, to 90 teams just through word of mouth 
um, across news as we proved that the formula works. And then it grew to 600 more teams once our director generals came on board. Back in the day, it was uh, Lord Tony Hall who first backed our project um, and made the growth of it go exponential within the BBC. But one of the things across all the hundreds of teams that take part that um, was obvious from the beginning was that they were struggling to actually find women spokespeople, um, which um, now, three years later, is quite astonishing. But um, at the time, it was a real problem. And the problem was very much the organisations that we would go to were not putting women spokespeople up. So we looked at this from two different perspectives. We looked at it from um, what we could do in terms of us, us as journalists. So we crowdsourced contacts and we created what we now call the New Voices database, which has more than one and a half thousand women contributors on there. It's now about to expand into including ethnicity and disability representation as well, because 5050 is now starting to use those core principles that I talked about to monitor ethnicity and disability contributors too. So we have the database, but then we started thinking, you know, we, the BBC on our own, trying it to make a difference is perhaps not going to, to, to kind of cut it, um, I suppose, uh, for other organisations, for those who are feeding us with those um, experts. So we thought, let's see if we can get some other media organisations to join us. Um, and we were really fortunate in getting many um, organisations to join us. ABC Australia was one of our first joiners. Um, and um, recently with them, we've just launched, as I say, this ethnicity and disability work that we're doing. But then, you know, we saw with the media organisations a real impact. We did start seeing that because we were all asking for women um, experts as well as male experts, that um, organisations were offering that to us. But we wanted to go further. So then we started asking um, PR companies and marketing agencies, would they join 5050? And many of them signed up. Then we thought, well, what about the actual companies themselves? What about the businesses themselves? So we're getting them to join up. And last week, we saw our first law firm, Adelshaw Goddard, join up too. And what all these organisations are doing is they're using the 50-50 methodology in their comms. Um, so monitoring their own communications internally and in their press releases, but also monitoring the spokespeople that they're putting forward to us as the media, but also to event companies as well. So all of this is in the mix, but then we're also thinking even further ahead and among our partners are journalism schools and they use 50-50 in their news days uh, when students uh, do those mock days, the uh, newspaper days or TV days um, to reach 50% women in those examples. And the, the thinking behind this was that if we could get our future journalists coming into the industry already thinking about representation and putting it at the heart of their storytelling, that could be a long term game changer. Uh, before I open to those questions that are popping up um, in the chat, um, I'll leave you on, you know, basically one of the big push points that we used to get. Um, and that was um, around this idea of the golden rule so you know i used to have program team um leaders say well we already get the best contributors on air and so i would say to them how do you know they would look at me quizzically and say what do you mean and i would say my question again how do you know you're getting the best guests on air do you know that because you are looking for other new talent out there new voices or is it because you regularly get them on your program then all of a sudden you see this penny drop when they realize that actually, yeah, the only reason they think they're the best is because they get them on all the time. And it's that mindset change. When you see that happen, that's a really exciting moment. And it's one that our audiences have seen and noticed. Across the BBC, we're seeing that our appreciation figures are, are, are up uh, when there is a noticeable increase in women's representation. BBC online content, certain demographics are now consuming more of our content where there are more women uh, represented. So for me, um, it's about finding those news voices. It's about finding those stories. 
there's a business case to doing it as well. It's not just the right thing to do to increase women's representation. So I hope to hear that many of you will join us on this journey too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina, for your very inspiring presentation of 5050. I'm just popping in. I'm Florian, and I work with the Anissa, who just showed up. Uh, I'm uh, the head of media partnerships in Spark News, and I'll be moderating the questions today because we have a few questions in the chat, so we'll have to go quite quickly through them, but hopefully Nina will have uh, some answers. Um, we have a question from um, Valbona, who is asking us, um, how to convince broadcasters, especially private networks, to apply that approach? Because apparently in the Balkans, um, it's not that easy to have this voluntary approach. So how do you, um, maybe regulatory uh, authorities could help with that? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've, it's an interesting one. So, um, I mean, I think the reason why 50-50 works is because we have this kind of grassroots top-down approach if you know what you know what it means so it because it came from the content makers and we wanted it to happen um that was the real kind of powerful message and um, that that kind of came across i think that you're also right that we need uh buy-in from from the top but i think it is around the media themselves wanting to push it forward. I think there's a real business case to increasing women's representation. And so it's about pushing that um, to the regulators. Um, but it's like any kind of diversity initiative, unless you know people really want to do it, it's not gonna happen. And so it's trying to make sure that the people who are doing the work actually buy in. Um, you know, edict, edicts from the top don't necessarily make a difference on the ground. So I, I think it, it's a bit of both, really, that we need to be getting to. It probably works better when everyone's on the same boat. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. We have another question um, coming from South Africa, I think. Um, it's great to hear that 50-50 is adding ethnicity and disability, but what about gender identity and sexual orientation? Yeah, good question. So 50-50 um, is a perception project. Um, so it's what our audiences see, hear and read. Um, and so what we're doing in the first instance is looking at the different um, kind of underrepresented groups that we can um, work with in terms of that side of um, uh, kind of diversity. We will be looking next at uh, what we call socioeconomic diversity um, in the UK. So this is um, for people who um, perhaps have not been so um, economically advantaged um, in the past. So we'll be looking at those groups and seeing how we can translate uh, what we've learned from uh, 50-50 to that and then I think I'm hoping that one day once we work that out then we can move on to the other um, areas which are not perceptible um, such as gender identity and um, there are projects that exist um, which I'm sure other people know about which there's one called Project Diamond in the um, UK where it's a, a form filling based exercise uh, to identify what someone's um, gender identity or sexual orientation is. Um, so there are those kind of uh, monitoring projects out there. Let's see how they get on, I think. Um, thank you. The time is running out a little bit. We have time, time for maybe one last quick answer to a question, uh, Silva Africa. Um, how has this approach uh, been perceived in patriarchal environments, uh, like for example, in Africa? What were the challenges in these in these countries? Uh, Africa's, uh, is, BBC Africa has actually um, done brilliantly well um, in terms of um, increasing uh, their women's representation on our content. The one thing that has been really interesting for those um, other countries, not like the UK, um, but as you say, where there, there's more patriarchal, um, culture is that we set the bar lower than 50 uh, percent we um set them at about 20 percent to start with so that they so that our content teams had the ability and an achievable goal to try and reach and then we we've been kind of upping it along the way um, and i'm happy to say that bbc africa um, and bbc arabic um have programs that all hit 50 percent women now um, and i think that is 
a real sign of progress and achievement. Thanks a lot. Um, we, we, we had a lot of questions uh, coming from all around the world. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer them all now. Uh, and Anissa is back on stage, which I think means that we have to move on. <laughs> Anisa. Yes, uh, so thank you so much, Nina, for this inspiring speech and incredible work. Again, congratulations. Um, sorry if everyone, we couldn't take everyone's. Yes, if you also have um, put in place other gender intentional practices in your own work or newsrooms. Uh, but it's in the meantime, it's my pleasure to welcome on stage Luba Kosova. Uh, Luba is a director and co-founder of ACAS, an international audience strategy consultancy. And in her work over the past two decades, she has continuously analyzed the gender differences of audiences internationally, including key differences in their media and news consumption. So Luba will be joining us in a few seconds, I'm sure. Hi, Anissa. Hi, Luba. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, so again, uh, before I pop out, uh, I'm just going to let you everyone know that uh, Luba will be speaking for 10 minutes and then we'll be taking 10 minutes of Q&A session. So again, feel free to drop your questions on the chat or a question uh, box on the right side of your screen. Thank you again, Luba, for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Anissa, for having me. I look, uh, I'm very, I feel very privileged to be presenting today. Um, and I shall share my screen now. Lovely. Can you see my screen? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Lovely. All right. So thank you again for um, having me here today to present um, um, five key insights from the Missing Perspectives of Women in COVID news report, which was commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and came out last month. Um, Sorry. So first of all, just very quickly to tell you what the story is in a nutshell. Women, uh, one, women are dramatically impacted by the pandemic to the same, if not greater degree than men in every area of their life. Yet their share of quoted voice in the news as sources, experts and protagonists is significantly marginalized compared to that of men. There are many explanations to that, but I would like to um, share four with you very quickly. Firstly, uh, women's increased invisibility in political decision making uh, in the coronavirus story is a big uh, driver of this. Um, because the story is actually driven by politicians and very early on was framed uh, in war terms that push, uh, which pushed women out further. Secondly, uh, women who are uh, scientific experts are pushed out by men scientists in the news. Thirdly, in times of crisis, journalists seem to revert back to well-established uh, sources who tend to be men. And fourthly, there is a historical and existing bias in um, using more male uh, men protagonists in news stories. However, there are good news. Uh, there are many uh, solutions of which I've identified 21 uh, in the report for how this can be mitigated at the point of news gathering and news production. So um, I will now go through five key insights and recommendations from the report. Please do reach out if you want to know more. Um, also, obviously, the report is freely available online. Um, so the first insight is despite the fact that women have unique political, socioeconomic, cultural, health, healthcare, and psychological challenges, their share of voice in the news is marginalized. 
just to single out one uh, um, health challenge in some socially conservative countries, women uh, are left out of testing. However, often that which has an incredible impact uh, on their uh, lives and the lives of their loved ones, um, but is rarely reported in the news. Um, um, similarly, there are many socioeconomic and so, so, um, psychological challenges to highlight. One that has very wide ramifications for women, they, they tend to be the primary caregivers in charge of homeschooling and the health of spouses and parents during uh, the pandemic, which uh, means that they suffer in terms of their economic um, employment and health outcomes. Um, and very importantly, this has been picked up by many uh, news organizations who reported about the uh, on this report. Women have been largely locked out of COVID uh, uh, country level decision making in five of the six countries which we analyzed. Um, uh, and the countries were UK, United States, Nigeria, India, Kenya, and South Africa. In fact, in England, 100% of the daily body at the time when we did the research, which was between March and mid April consisted of men. And, and what's tragic about this um, and, uh, and the fact that women are marginalized in the news is that uh, when their voices are not heard, they have very um, limited chance of influencing policies uh, that deal with the pandemic uh, and, and, and uh, with every element of, of their lives. So despite all these challenges, women shares uh, uh, women's share of quoted voice in um, in COVID news is between three and five times smaller than that of men. Just to help you navigate the slides, women are uh, uh, the bars in red and men are the bars in orange. So and and that's universally the case. We cannot say that it's better in some countries than others because uh, it really is universally the case. So insight number two, the gender dimension is not salient at all for journalists covering COVID-19 news. How we know that um, the uh, Media Ecosystems Analysis Group did a, a very significant content analysis of one point, uh, almost two million stories across the six countries we were looking at. And what uh, was um, very um, clearly uh, became evident is that gender equality coverage is virtually absent from COVID-19 news. Uh, third uh, insight, women's scientific and political expertise is underused and undervalued in COVID-19 coverage, and therefore they fail to shape the news angles which then influence policies, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so a portrayal analysis that my team did revealed that women are least likely to be used as experts and commentators on the COVID, uh, uh, on the pandemic uh, in news and most likely to be used as sources of anecdotal evidence. And I shall actually take the time to read a really heartbreaking quote for you, which really impacted me when I was writing the report. And it's written by US and European women scientists. As women were deeply involved in COVID-19 science, it has become clear to us that our expertise means little when it comes to real decision making in this public health emergency. We're frustrated that our work is being overlooked and misrepresented in the media. We're exhausted knowing that after this is all over, we will have a powerful fight on our hands to reclaim the professional ground that is slipping away from us during the emergency. The fourth insight is that there is danger that overuse of facts uh, that don't hang on to um, human stories may be leading to dehumanization of the news coverage of the pandemic. The portrait analysis that my team did concluded that 74% of all the stories um, uh, e about COVID um, in the six countries were uh, uh, solely um, 
centered around facts and only 25% were around centered around people and of those only 10% were centered around women and of uh, all the stories only 9% had a human interest story element in that in them Finally, the fifth insight is uh, that the, uh, the perspective of men protagonists in stories dominates the news about COVID-19. Women are significantly also, uh, uh, to, um, moreover, women are significantly less likely to, to be portrayed as empowered protagonists in the news. So again, looking at the content analysis, which Meek did, we can see that we, uh, men are between three and six times more likely to, to have been protagonists in the news about COVID in the period of the content analysis. And when um, uh, uh, the vast majority of protagonists who are portrayed as empowered are actually men, 83% of them are men and only 17% of the empowered individuals in the news about COVID are women. So after all this rather bleak and, and potentially very, very sad picture that I've portrayed, I just want to emphasize that there is good news and there are many ways that news gathering, news production team can, um, can use to amplify women's voices in the COVID-19 news coverage. So here are 21 recommendations that I hope you'll take time in your leisure to look through. Um, the uh, slides will be provided uh, by the Spark News team. But I shall focus today on six. The first two are news gathering, and actually they very much echo what Nina has just presented. First of all, raising awareness of the existing bias towards male experts is incredibly important because journalists would not be able to act unless they're aware, or any human being, unless we're aware of our biases. Secondly, providing lists of women um, experts on health, medicine and research has shown to be very effective in some countries, um, uh, uh, Scandinavian countries um, like Denmark, and Nina just spoke about the new sources database that the BBC has put together, which clearly is helping also uh, for them to meet their 50-50 quota. So these are really important um, recommendations for news gathering. In terms of news outputs, I've singled out four to share with you the, the number eight. Amplify the views of women who are political, healthcare and business leaders when reporting on COVID-19 stories. And as journalists, I would implore you to consider to challenge politicians, for example, why are, are there advisory and decision-making boards only made up of men, of vast majority of men, not to ignore uh, uh, this um, situation because it has very bad, significant ramification on policy-making for women. Uh, the ten, um, tenth recommendation, ensure a healthy proportion of women protagonists are portrayed on what just portraying women is really important in the news uh, uh, as subjects, but also making sure that uh, women are empowered rather than men's sidekicks or victims. The 13th recommendation, um, develop relevant story treatments uh, uh, rel that are relevant to women. So COVID-19's impact on women's employment, healthcare, reproductive rights, education on their children, on girls, gender-based violence, and also focus on solution. Research, uh, academic research has shown that women are particularly interested in positive angles of stories in news. And the 20th recommendation is exemplify facts with personal stories to humanize the COVID-19 story and avoid desensitization amidst the sea of, of loss that we are all experiencing around the world. So just um, lastly, I just wanted to highlight that there is a bigger report coming out uh, in November that I've authored again and was commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation the missing perspectives of women in the news and that report will look at the structural reasons be behind women's underrepresentation across the whole value new, uh, ch new ch chain of uh, news um, so um, thank you very much for and I look forward to the questions thank you very much Luba for a pretty dense report as we can see um, it's uh, 
quite uh, it's a little bit depressing, but at least you showed us that there's still hope, which is cool. Uh, and we actually have a question from the chat from Barbona again. Um, so, um, Vabona is saying that these decisions are made by editors, not journalists. So, do you think having network of not network of women journalists uh, is it efficient to tackle this underrepresentation, or should it aim for more mainstreaming gender through editorial policies? I think the situation is so incredibly dire and and unexpectedly so for all of us that. The solution should be sought on every level of the organization, at the level of um, uh, uh, newsroom, uh, newsroom leadership, at governance level, as well as um, news production uh, outputs uh, uh, in order for any results to, to be achieved. And I actually think that we need to be very careful not to make this a problem that has needs to be resolved by women journalists or women editors because it's a societal issue that has very deep implications for us all. Therefore, uh, um, society and newsrooms need, need to um, resolve it uh, across gender, if that makes sense. It does. And in, in the report, do you have any solutions or insights that would maybe, or arguments that would help uh, having this conversation between men and women? Um, having a conversation between men and women. Uh, the recommendations are not, they're much more um, um, at a strategic level than tactical level. But the, the overarching thing that I can say, it's really important to uh, in the news to present and reflect back the needs of women as well as the needs of men. And uh, uh, because otherwise we're building an, a picture that is very um, gender biased and, and, and women are missing completely from that. Okay, um, thank you. We have another question, more practical this time. Uh, does this report only analyze news that was reported in English? Yes, it does. We were very pressed for time um, and had to turn around this report very quickly. Therefore, one of the criteria for the selected countries was that the language which, uh, in which, uh, which the content analysis was using was English. And um, you were talking about the upcoming report. Uh, is it also a report that only, I mean, only, <laughs> sorry, a lot of work, but that uh, um, includes other languages, for example? Um, so the report covers four continents. It's the same country. So um, there is obviously UK, which is a European country, US, North America. There are three countries in um, the three uh, main regions in Africa and also uh, India. So we're confident that we're covering a very um, big part of the world. But yes, the focus is on, on English again. However, in the upcoming reports, there are uh, enormous number. We've used enormous uh, amounts of different methodologies, including literature review of about 2000 um, academic articles, as well as uh, loads of surveys of different members of the public in each of those countries, um, uh, and, and uh, number of databases. So it's a very, very robust and comprehensive piece of work. In fact, one of the members of the advisory group is Ross Atkins, whom Nina mentioned, who started the 5050 uh, project at the BBC. Thank you very much, Luba. Um, so in these webinars, we, we like to highlight uh, solutions, of course. And do you think you could share us a little more insights? Because you said they were like uh, much more than the one you, you showcased. Uh, could you give us another few nibbles uh, in terms of solutions in the newsroom? Um, so the, the, the solutions that um, I highlighted um, 
the six that I um, highlighted were the ones that I believe are really most important to tackle. But another few that I can um, that I can mention is, for example, uh, in terms of the COVID story, using more health correspondents rather than political uh, or business correspondents um, would be really helpful because health correspondents in newsrooms are more likely to be women. Um, and political correspondence and business uh, tend to be men. So this is a way to rebalance. Um, another thing would be to uh, develop COVID-19 related features centered around women and to uh, launch series of pieces or program examining and zoning on uh, specifically on women's needs uh, from COVID news. Thank you so much, Luba, for all of this very interesting insights and conversation. Uh, we'll be sharing with you the report very soon in an upcoming newsletter that you'll be getting next week. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to ask you, I mean, if you haven't seen the poll section yet, uh, we have a question for you to kind of see what you've been doing in your newsrooms uh, on gender uh, equality. So please share with us your insights. We're very happy to get more information on what you've been doing on your own or with your newsrooms. Um, but I'm so glad. So Luba, again, thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, we're going to continue this webinar with our panel discussion. So I'm so glad today uh, to be introducing to you Ravin Sampat, the senior editor at the BBC and today's moderator of our panel discussion. So Ravin specializes in current affairs across digital and audio and has always worked towards rethinking the way we make the news. Hi, Ravin. Hi, how are you doing? You all right? Yes, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. We have a wonderful panel coming up, uh, but I'm going to let you introduce them. They will be put on stage uh, very shortly by our team, uh, and we'll have about 20, 25 minutes of discussion, uh, and then a 15 minutes uh, Q&A session. So again, don't hesitate to share your questions, your insights uh, with us, and we'll be more than happy to share that along uh, with the panel. So just like that, they appear. That's great. Okay. That's, that's good. Magic. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, and that was a really interesting discussion just now um, and great presentations. And I think it's lots of food for thought for all of us in the media industry. Um, so look, I, uh, I, I don't introduce myself because I'm not important here. Um, I think we're in for a real treat today. So we've got three of the best thinkers in the news industry who are pushing forward what I'd call is real change in gender um, equality. Um, one is from a traditional media organization where change could be hard. One is from a new media organization where change is the mantra. And one is working on a hyper local level in a very male dominated society where I think change is often uh, rejected. I'll let you guys work out between yourselves who you think you are, but you probably know who you are. Um, Look, I just want to say from the beginning, change is not an easy is not an easy thing. Whether it's life, work, societal, something more personal, it takes time to get used to, and it takes people to go on a on a journey with you. But I think history favors those that kind of persevere with it. And um, the three speakers we have today are are pushing that forward. Um, so I, what I want to do, I just want to make sure that we we can we can have time for questions and get across your ideas and thoughts on what's going on. So I'll introduce the panel very quickly. So first we've got. Emily Ramshaw is the CEO and co-founder of The 19th in the US. They're doing some great journalism at the moment. I can't believe you've got time for us. Haven't you got an election? Or don't you have to go send in some ballots <laughs> and a vote or something? I mean, you're, you're, you're you know, for, so thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Um, you launched a non-profit gender and politics news media startup in January. And the website went live in August. Uh, and what an amazing launch. You had Meghan Markle interview you for the inaugural summit. Absolutely amazing. Um, and I think what's interesting about you guys is that you're really redefining the journalistic norms. So in culture, culture, your coverage of intersexuality and gender, uh, something that we could all be learning from. Um, I have two questions for each panelist before I go and introduce the next one. What's the weather like outside where you are? And in one word, can you describe your pandemic? <laughs> uh, the weather outside, unfortunately, in Austin, Texas, is about 50 degrees, which is very cold for us. We're not used to this. Uh, one word of the pandemic. Um, it's maybe a hyphenated word, child care. Oh, okay. 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 Actually, I, I have to warn you, mine might be dog care. If my dog appears randomly through this <laughs> chat, I apologize. Um, thank you. Uh, next, we've got Sutomo Ishii. I hope I've said that correctly. Very good. Very good. 
Thank you very much from the Asahi Shimbun uh, newspaper in Japan. You're, I think you're the managing editor, or is it deputy managing editor? So far, deputy. <laughs> deputy. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, this is the one of the oldest and most respected national daily newspapers in Japan, publishing in Japanese and English. Um, and what's interesting about you guys is, you know, you made a gender equality declaration in April 2020, and I'm really happy that you're here. You know, we can go into that. The quote is from there is, seeking to become a media leader for the empowerment of women for its reporting and business operations. That sounds fascinating. So I hope you can, I'll, I'll come to you soon on that. What's the weather like outside in Tokyo? It's quite late as well, isn't it? Yeah, actually, I now live in, uh, near from Osaka, uh, western part of Japan, and uh, much, a uh, little bit warmer than in Tokyo. And uh, I'd say temperature is about maybe 15 now. Okay, and your pandemic in one word? Pandemic is okay. I mean, relatively okay in Japan, as you may know. Uh, I don't know if it's because of, uh, you know, the weather or climate or uh, some, you know, other natures, but uh, uh, relatively well controlled. But still, we have to be, be careful about that. Good. You're actually in the best part of Japan. I think you've got the best food in Osaka. <laughs> uh, you know, you know well. I love it. Osaka is really a ton of, you know, delicious food. Exactly. We can talk about food all day. Um, next, we've got, thank you for that. Next, we've got Dee Shamalik, who's the CEO of Chambo Media, which is a media start running Kabar Lahari in India. Um, for, for the last couple of decades, this, this organization has been empowering rural women in India to become journalists, um, reporting as insiders within the communities themselves. Something that I think a lot of news organizations struggle to do. They have this kind of outside view of communities. And actually, we've got somebody that there amongst it reporting from within um you've gone from a, a black and white newspaper to a digital led platform um you've done that in 18 years so that was in 2002 it was a newspaper that's a, that's amazing uh, and you publish in several languages and in a country of many languages that's that's pretty impressive um how is the weather outside where you are where, where are you based right now in india i'm in delhi right now okay so what cold hot smoky very okay smart. very smart okay and in one word how can you describe your pandemic uh busy okay yep i think for all of us that's been busy yeah. um emily i want to start off with you um how do you start a company in a global pandemic um and uh why did you decide to start the 19th and i guess the, the thing i really want to know is were you not seeing enough change around you so you just thought well i might as well just start it myself all right so those are multi-pronged questions and i'll finish with the pandemic part which is the hardest part of all of it to answer you know honestly for me this all started four years ago um, when hillary clinton and donald trump were running against each other and i had a brand new baby girl i was on maternity leave and I felt in that moment like there were so many conversations in the United States about electability and likability, which were conversations that felt sort of fundamentally sexist to me. And I thought in that moment, you know, why hasn't anybody started a national newsroom of record for women? And then I went back to trying to keep a small human alive, and I put that idea out of my head entirely. And then three years later, I just felt like the conditions had not improved. And if anything, we had more women running um, for president in the United States than we'd ever had before, more women of color running for president. And the conversations were still the same. And maybe they were a little worse. They were around, you know, is she too ambitious? Does she want it too much? And those were conversations that didn't just seem sexist to me. They also seemed racist. <laughs> and, and so in that moment, I just decided I couldn't wait any longer, that the national narrative in the United States needed to change, and that I wanted to launch the 19th, which is aimed at elevating the voices of women of color uh, in American media and making all of our journalism entirely free to consume and entirely free to republish. So we always intended, we, we sort of soft launched in January, we intended to launch in August. Um, obviously the pandemic was not part of our plans. Uh, a lot of us have small kids, we suddenly had no childcare, we were fundraising like crazy to make this happen and suddenly, you know, tons of our funding dried up. Um, you know, we almost stopped, we almost waited a year, but then we felt like this pandemic would disproportionately affect women in every arena other than mortality rates and would hit women of color, underserved women hardest. 
And so we forged ahead and it was crazy. Um, we are still just barely keeping our heads above water. You know, we are 11 weeks old now. We officially launched in August. Um, it's, I don't recommend launching something new during a pandemic. Uh, I am, I am relatively risk averse for even for a startup person. And that has, you know, heightened the degree of difficulty a lot. So we are somehow managing to do this in a very crazy time. Great. And just on, I, I think you, you revert, you, you talk, spoke about the change there. Where are you working previously, the Texas Tribune? What did you, what challenges were there that might have led you to leave this journey where you are now? Honestly, I had a dreamy job. I, I spent 10 years launching a startup in Texas, really aimed at, at bringing a, a diverse and ideologically diverse audience to the table. Um, I learned a lot of lessons there that I took on this next leap. The only thing I was more interested in than sort of Texas politics and policy was women politics and policy. Great, great. Sorry, I just went to the questions quickly. Um, Sutomo, can I ask you, so you announced the uh, Gender Equality Declaration April this year. My question for you is quite loaded. Can mainstream media change? I think so, uh, because I, uh, you know, not about, you know, if we can, but we, we have to, uh, because, you know, it's a requirement of the society and it's a requirement of, uh, you know, ourselves and uh, it's something to do with our basic human rights. Uh, so as, as a media, we have to take a read about that. So. Uh, we are reporting uh, so many things about uh, gender equality so far, and also we focus on so many issues like uh, uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But uh, or, you know, while we are reporting on those issues, then uh, people and leaders will ask, "What about you? You know, what about yourself?" Then uh, we check uh, our own, you know, uh, gender equality. Then we found so many issues uh, in ourselves. Then uh, while we are advocating those issues, we have to uh, reform ourselves together at the same time. So that's the, the main reason why we started uh, this uh, initiative as a <clears throat> gender equal declaration uh, this uh, April. So uh, we are not only focusing on reporting, but also focusing on our own uh, business operations. Then uh, we have to you know, set some target goals not to the level of 50-50, but maybe we start 40-40. And uh, so sometimes uh, we focus on special uh, feature stories on HITO. That means uh, uh, people, uh, person in news, uh, we pick up at least 40% of, of those. Uh, it's, it's almost everyday news uh, in the morning edition. So we pick up uh, at least 40% uh, women uh, a month. So, so far uh, since uh, the April, uh, we, we almost achieved that goal. Uh, last month in September, we uh, uh, women's rate is 43.5%, and so far in the last six months, uh, we uh, achieved to the level of 39.6%. So it's almost 40-40, but not yet enough, but still we are improving. Yeah, yeah, it's never enough. And I guess, because you just launched this in April, what, what does that do for an organization when you make a declaration like that? and it's coming top down um and it, maybe it came bottom up as well maybe there was an urge you know in the well, newsroom as well. it's, uh, we have started so many series of articles on uh gender issues and also sdgs issues in the last maybe four or five years and then uh, of course uh, on gender issues we uh gather we collected some of the uh, female reporters from uh, every section of the news political news section or economic news section or city news section then they, uh, you know, made a kind of group. Uh, th those are the uh, advocates of these news. Then uh, it's a more like a bottom-up step, you know. Uh, they uh, push to the executives, we have to do something uh, as a company. So uh, it's not at the top down from the president because all of the, most of the uh, executive members are still, you know, uh, male in my company. Uh, we have, I think, uh, three, four female exec uh, executive officers, but out of maybe 20, 25. So uh, uh, then uh, uh, younger generations and female reporters, uh, uh, those are the ones who uh, push us uh, to, to change. Well, well said, well said. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Disha, your, your model's fascinating. I mean, 
you're empowering local communities in a completely different way. You're getting them to tell their stories on the ground. It's it's really organic. It's from the ground up. You're 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 upskilling people. You're kind of doing a number of different things. Actually, you're not just doing journalism. You're doing so many different things. I guess in a society like India, what are the main obstacles that you've found, and is there anything you can share with how you kind of have tackled that going forward? Yeah, I think um, uh, just to say at first that I'm I'm talking about a particular context, and so a lot of the stuff that I say about our model um, maybe can't be extrapolated to talk about the general media in in India. I mean, some of it, of course, can. Some of it can be kind of relevant. Uh, globally as well, um, but we work in rural Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh, which are, are quite underdeveloped. They're huge and populous states. They're very, very feudal areas, and so um, it's not easy to uh, extricate gender per se from other social uh, inequities. So we work with categories like gender and caste very closely. What we set out to do was to bring um, a marginalized voice into the mainstream media narrative. So bring women, but women from Dalit and tribal and Muslim backgrounds into the mainstream media narrative. Not to do community journalism and not to do citizen journalism, but to do everyday reporting that's important to them. So run local newspapers and local um, digital platforms. That's, that's what we do. So what we're doing is rubbing up against very, very entrenched kind of feudal structures like caste and gender uh, in a context where, where um, I don't know if you guys have heard, but just uh, last month we had a brutal rape and murder of a girl in our, in our district of uh, Uttar Pradesh, which quickly becomes very political because uh, she was a Dalit girl. The perpetrators were allegedly upper caste boys, her neighbors. Um, the local administration was from the ruling party. The um, um, and so so what we're rubbing up against are kind of long, long centuries and centuries of um, uh, communities who are not really meant to have access to knowledge creation at all. And so we're saying that it will be these communities who are on the margins of society who will be distributing news and who will also have the ability to produce news and distribute uh, for their for their communities. They will have the ability to be able to question authorities who are sitting, you know, political authorities, um, social authorities. They will be influencers. And this is really, really difficult for a local community to, to stomach. I, I saw that 95% of the readership is men. Is that correct? Um, I mean, I would say when we were a newspaper, it would probably be 99% of the readership was male. Now we are a video first platform, we're a YouTube channel essentially. So I think the percentage is about 90% male um, and 10% uh, women. And that depends also on the content and, and stuff like that and the region of viewership. So, but it's increased a little bit. So, and, and have you had to... In terms of your content, oh, yeah, you yeah, to... and Hindu, the the viewership. Um, so it's interesting because it's it's a group of journalists who are from marginalized backgrounds, often don't have any formal education in in journalism, and they're women, but they're speaking to an audience who are upper class, upper caste men, um, and telling them what the news is, telling them what their political opinions are. Well, it's it's, def it's definitely inspiring, and I think there's a number of other media organizations that could definitely learn from what you're doing from the from the ground up just on 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 in terms of um the impact of what you're doing and I, this is actually a question for all of you i mean so Tom mentioned about changing mindset and he also mentioned about the impact on readership i mean for you disha what kind of thing have you seen happen in terms of your readers have there been like pushback has there been actually i want more of this has there been uh, have you been opening up people's eyes in different ways what kind of things have you learned from that yeah, I mean, I, it really struck me when you said uh, we've been doing this for 18 years and, you know, Emily's uh, startup is, is so fresh and so new and I feel so jaded and so tired a lot of the time. <laughs> um, uh, so in, in a lot of ways, I feel like we have transformed the way that people see women in that area. And in a lot of ways, nothing has changed. It seems like crime only increases. 
we get told by funders all the time what have you been able to do when we read about you know like 10 rapes every day in uttar pradesh so clearly having feminist news is not really changing the way that people think um but i think yeah multiple levels of of i mean i think that we 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 call ourselves a hyper local newsroom and i think it really matters that there are local journalists doing ground reporting because like you said a lot of new newsrooms don't have the resources to send people out into the field to do kind of reporting in in remote areas yeah. so we have a highly credible newsroom where we have local journalists who are telling the news and so that business model has become kind of you know credible and sustainable and and so on um sorry i have mm -hmm. yeah in, i in, would just say you know yeah. i think for, i think you're i mean obviously it's it's sort of easy to get dejected when you watch sort of the pace of change but the stories that you all are telling are getting national and international headlines i mean the the story you were just talking about you know I, these are terrible cases the like the rape case you were just mentioning but at least it's now um it's spurring like sort of even international outrage which i think is a result of you all continuing to beat the drum on these issues and i hope eventually i think you know, I hope the United States has gets a taste of its own medicine here. But I think like that international shame that's associated with big stories like that um, has an impact. And I think you all are doing this. so. Don't sell yourself short in that regard. Like I think this generational um, we're seeing generational change, and I think so much of that is because you all have continued to beat the drum on these issues. Yeah, I think that that's really something that's come from being able to have made the leap from print and a very kind of local distribution to a digital platform. So the news reaches places where we never thought that it would reach. I mean, otherwise, the impact used to be mapped in terms of, you know, we report on a well that hasn't been cleaned in 10 years and that well gets cleaned or, you know, roads that haven't been built in 50 years and roads get built because no one else is doing that reporting. So we can see that tangible impact. But I think in terms of speaking to a wider audience and amplifying rural issues or women's issues in remote areas, I think that that is something that the digital platform has been able to give. Thank you for that, Disha. Um, Emily, let's just assume like you're the favorite in the room because you've got the clear slate and you can do whatever you want and you can start fresh, whereas everyone else has got these historic things behind them that they're trying to change. What can you share with other people on this on this call today in terms of if you had a clean slate, this is how you should approach it. Because I'm sure actually having worked in a startup, it's actually really refreshing. If something doesn't work, you can just stop it tomorrow, have a cup of tea and start again. <laughs> organizations can't yeah. do that. It, they have to maybe raise a ticket with IT and tell them we'd like to stop producing this thing. And maybe in a year's time, the funding will be taken away. Who knows? What, yeah. what could you share? What could you share that is like instant that you're just like, this is what you can do? That always it always sounds so dreamy to be part of a startup because it's like at the very beginning it's like turning a speed boat versus like turning a cruise liner right like you can move you can change you can throw out what's not working very fast uh, you know even at the Texas Tribune where I was before this you know ten years in um, it doesn't feel like a startup anymore at all it certainly feels like a bigger institution there those are harder changes to make so I think um, from the ground floor some things that we've been doing first of all it's it was super easy to hire probably one of the most representative and diverse newsrooms in the country you know three quarters of our founding journalists were women of color we hired one of the only openly transgender reporters in the country to uh, cover issues at the intersection truly you know of gender politics and policy um, it was so seen seamless and easy to build this extraordinary newsroom when you hear so many newsrooms in America struggling with, well, how do I, how do we make our newsrooms more diverse? How do we build a more representative staff? Doing that from the ground floor is like the easiest possible thing to do. Those candidates are there and they're extraordinary. So I would say that has been the easiest piece. Um, there are lots of things that haven't been so easy, but especially given the fact that 80% of our newsroom, we've never met in person. <laughs> so oh, wow. like we've been, okay. yeah, cool. yeah, they're all over the country and we've been in a pandemic. So uh, the same way I'm meeting you all like this is how most of our staff interact. And that part is super strange to do um, with a startup. So how, when you've worked in, actually that's a really interesting point because we're all working, I guess everybody on this call is, I mean, some people are still going into the office, but we're all working in uniquely different ways and we're all, I guess, embracing it or, or struggling. There's a lot of people that I know struggling to work like this. There's nothing quite like um, the buzz of the newsroom. I have to say, like, it's it's up there for me with, I compare it to two things, really good food and also really good whiskey. There's also the newsroom. 
because the buzz of the newsroom is when you're in the newsroom and, and something happens and suddenly just by that coffee machine a lot of minds come together and think about what we should be doing how can we do it how do we tackle that issue it's a big issue what do we do it's really important and i have i have found for a lot of younger younger members of staff who maybe started new jobs in in the world in the world of news they've not had that they've had everything on zoom and it feels quite disconnected so I guess what 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 have you learned in terms of how you can run a newsroom? Because I don't think we're getting out of this situation anytime sooner, and the struggle must continue. Like we've all got to continue pushing and changing the way you guys are doing it. You guys are all doing it in amazing ways, but really, in a pandemic over Zoom, people just want to do business and just just get the stuff done. They, so, so I'm saying it's change harder in a pandemic. How have you kind of approached that? I mean, yes, it is, but I'm gonna, I'll take a sort of uh, ulterior view, and that is that actually for women in this moment, um, it's proving the case uh, that we've known all along, which is that you don't need to be in the editing chair from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in order to get the job done. It's making visible a lot of aspects of our lives that we felt like we had to keep hidden before, whether it's having a baby nursing on your lap during a, a staff meeting or trying to navigate your kid's school in the other room while you're on a call. I actually think um, in many ways men are having to um, step up and experience a lot of those uh, aspects of sort of caregiving that they weren't having to experience necessarily before or are at least exposed to it at least in the United States more than they have been before so yes like it's totally hard all of this sucks this there's nothing fun about it <laughs> um, it the newsroom camaraderie is it, it's heartbreaking to have lost that um, yeah. But I do hope we come out the other end of this with a clearer understanding of what caregiving looks like and um, and, and what it means for society uh, and a true understanding of what incredible multitaskers women are and how well we can get the job done. And uh, I, Sorry, I'll, yeah, go on, Deesha, go on, go on. I just wanted to jump in because I've written down exactly the same thing that Emily said just about how it's kind of stripped the kind of blinds off so much of stuff that we we uh, struggle to communicate in news reportage, which is meant to be very objective and you're not really meant to bring your gender and your caste and your ethnicity into it. Um, but we, we try and bring in issues of gender and, and how women see the world into that reportage. And I think that, that the pandemic has made it so clear. You know, we've had a 300% rise in the cases of reported uh, domestic violence. And, and things that we've been reporting about public health, what kinds of diseases get reported, what kinds of funds, public funds get utilized for whom, for what kinds of communities. All these things have become so clear now in, in reporting on, on the pandemic that I really think that it's it's been an opportunity for a feminist newsroom to say that this is how the world works. You choose to not see it most of the time, but this is how it actually works. That's, I think that's a really interesting point. There's news and there's noise and I think it's important to kind of get there's that there's that middle ground that as newsrooms we have to be you know there's numbers there's number of tests there's, there's all these numbers flowing around xyz but really it's what's bubbling here that I think is the thing that's really come up and actually um so Tom, I just wanted to ask you because I don't know how you've been working where you are and I know the situation in Japan is slightly different um to what we're experiencing here in europe i mean we're i don't know what wave we're in now in europe we're in probably not our 29th wave at the moment but we're experiencing some sort of wave um how is it how has it been for you because as somebody who's a agent of change and what you're trying to do where you are how have you managed to do that has it been easier i guess because of the tools that maybe you have i know at the bbc we have so many different tools of interacting with people actually we are quite we've got resources that we can use to engage people and keep them involved how, how have you dealt with this and what have you been trying to do to keep spirits up well of course you know as i mentioned the the level of you know infection in japan is relatively uh you know or slow and and you know relatively controlled but uh, at the same time uh business impact uh, we have very very much affected by this COVID, and uh, or still you know many companies are uh, keeping uh, work, their workers uh, work, working at home, and uh, then uh, their uh, you know outcome of business is uh, very much affected, like uh, all Nippon Airways, uh, you know record of deficit, and uh, so uh, among those, I think women uh, in uh, part-time jobs are very much vulnerable, vulnerable position in in Japan. I, uh, until last year, I was in London and I interviewed Ken Loach uh, when he made a film of I, you know, Daniel Brake. 
And I thought it's just a, a case in, in UK, but uh, now it's, it's, uh, it's here in Japan too. Uh, many women in, uh, you know, or less, uh, or, you know, or, uh, uh, any uh, any woman in uh, part time jobs uh, or single woman with uh, raising kids without having you know a divorced uh, woman are very much vulnerable and very much uh, suffering uh, out of this uh, COVID nineteen situation. So we are focusing on uh, so many challenges on SDGs after uh, uh, you know this COVID nineteen. So one of them is uh, poverty issues, especially poverty issues uh, in women. So that again, I didn't hear that last bit. Uh, I, I, I need to focus, we need to focus on uh, Japanese uh, women's poverty situation after oh, okay. COVID. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, that's great. Um, we've got, had a couple of, we've had a couple of questions come through, so I think maybe, I don't know what the, the I don't know if Florian maybe want to come in if this is the time for me to go to questions, I can just start doing it now, but there's a really, I think Nina's one is a really, really yeah, well, it's provocative, right, if you had to choose only one thing what would you do to increase uh, women representation in news? And then in brackets, apart from 50-50, of course. Um, one thing. If you had to choose one thing, sorry, I don't, didn't see this one in that if question. So if you had to choose one thing to improve representation. representation in news, what would it be? The one thing you could probably do tomorrow. I mean, as a staff, I guess you could do 10 things, but let's... <laughs> More, more women editors in chief. More women and more mothers as editors in chief. Okay. Yeah, I vouch for that. Disha. I think that the um, the the issue of viewership and readership. I mean, in India, we have huge internet penetration, but we have eight, eighty five percent of people who are using the internet are men, and so the representation of women or marginalized communities in the media isn't. I don't think going to change that much until if the viewership is still grossly skewed in in favor of men. So I think that increasing the accessibility of media to women is something that I would like to do. It's a good point, uh, Sutomo. I think the most important thing in Japan, especially, is to change politics uh, in terms of the issues of gender gaps. Because uh, as you may know, that uh, we are positioned the one twenty first out of one hundred fifty three. Uh, on the you know its gender uh, issues, but uh, uh, politics in Japan is much much worse because uh, uh, members of uh, MPs, uh, female members, is just ten percent. Uh, so it's uh, positioned one hundred sixty five out of one hundred ninety three. So through the media, we have to reform politics and we have to uh, em empower more female uh, to be uh, MPs. I think that's the start. But as the saying goes, if you can see it, you can be it. So I think actually, you're absolutely right there. Um, and I think that's something in, even in the in the UK, you know, in terms of diversity in newsrooms, female representation, it's a thing that comes up quite often that you're seeing the same faces and the same roles in the same things. And there's no real, real change, it's not a reflection of what, actually what how society is. Um, oh, Florian's joined us. I don't know, do you want me to continue, Florian, with these questions? I don't want to take uh, you today. If, if you can see the question in the chat, then just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. I can see. I mean, no one's asking questions. They're, they're putting notes in chat. So we've got another really interesting one here from Rachel um, about millennials. So I often thought that millennials who started working during a recession are now sometimes in middle or upper management during this recession are pretty resilient because they've never worked through the glory days. So how can we as managers both say that what we're doing is unsustainable and everyone is struggling and show empathy, but also showing that this chaos is teaching us something and that we're actually all good at it and we're gonna get through it long term. I think, can I go to Emily first on that? Because you've got the newest newsroom. Um, sure. You sort of started in a pandemic. How, 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 are you, how have you navigated that? First of all, I think Rachel, that's a beautiful question, and it's really put elegantly, which is that, like, you know, we are. I've got a newsroom of largely millennials. Some of them are younger than that. They are, you know, coming up the ranks. Many for many of them, this is their first or second journalism job, and they're doing it in a pandemic. And so, what we are trying to teach, and by the way, like we're doing it in the United States ahead of one of the craziest elections, you know, of our time. I'd say known to man, known to man or woman or anybody else. Um, and so. 
so we are trying we're trying to help our team practice a lot of self-care like we are trying to take care of um, the the reporters and editors who are working with us to remind them that like the emotional turmoil and what you're dealing with in your home life um, is none of this is normal this is so hard we're trying to provide support mechanisms we have I know a, those of you in European countries probably do this a heck of a lot better than the United States does, but we offer things like six months of fully paid family leave, four months of fully paid caregiver leave, which folks have needed during the pandemic, um, you know, to take care of sick relatives or to take care of children. We offer, we've offered childcare stipends. We fully cover health benefits. We do things that sort of try to um, make it easier on the folks who we work with to endure this time. At the same time, we are, um, we are teaching them really extraordinary skills right now about how to pivot, about how to manage a crisis, about how to you know, multitask, about how to maybe set the right standards for what work and life balance look like in this era when you're working at home and you have to figure out like when to turn things off. So, you know, in short, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one check ins. It's a lot of warmth. It's a lot of um, doing really sort of thoughtful things for our colleagues to remind them that we're looking out for them in this crazy moment, whether that's sending dinner to their house or sending them a small plant just because, or, you know, uh, and maybe part of this is women taking care of women. I'm curious if this happens in other, in other news environments or other startup environments, but, um, but it, it feels uh, like the right time to be maternal, uh, and that's sort of the the uh, the good and bad that comes along with that, the strict and rigid, and also the love and support, and I'm trying to channel that. Wow, okay, well, look, I'm gonna put my address in the chat. Please send me dinner as well, if you get, <laughs> if you get a chance. Um, Disha, can you can you tell us what you're, what you're doing about this? Yeah, I, I think also, Rachel, it's a really great and such a relevant question, and, and I resonate a lot with what, what Emily said. And, and I also wanted to say, Ravan, that one of the things that you said in the beginning I wanted to respond to was that it's, it's maybe easier to make change happen and to keep sustain change in in newsrooms and we have we have such a high attrition rate at Kabbalaria over the years we must have trained hundreds and hundreds of women and hundreds and hundreds of women have gotten beaten the shit out of by their husbands or fathers and then have dropped out subsequently and so um it's it's really really hard to actually hold people in the organization and what do you do and i think that again COVID and the pandemic has made that really clear. What, what's the work that goes into actually sustaining a gender or a diverse newsroom? Um, and so, so we've had to do a lot of the same things that, that Emily is saying in terms of health insurance, in terms of flexible work hours. Um, we've had to get uh, the rural team onto Zoom and these digital apps for the first time and run these self-care workshops. So we would have an entire village or you know families with 14 people crowded around one phone where we were having these intense one-on-one -on -one check-ins and you know self-care sessions and things like that just to just to build relationships between the millennials in the in the Delhi office who had just joined and you know didn't have a full sense of all the things that were going on and the people in the field who never ever stopped working i mean there wasn't a day of rest from the time that we started. So, you know, how, how do you uh, kind of bridge those and have empathy that goes across different um, geographical locations and castes and classes and stuff like that and say that, you know, there are things, there are forms of resilience in every social location, which other people in the team can learn from. Um, but we have to do a lot of that work more visibly. I think it became more visible for the first time in our history. We had team members who, committed suicide we had team members who passed away from tuberculosis because you know suddenly tuberculosis isn't big enough news so you know they just weren't getting enough care so we had to deal with all kinds of traumas in addition to the trauma of, of reporting so i think a lot of things just became more visible about running a newsroom like ours well props to you because you're you're, you're still there you're doing an amazing job and you know i i i, I can't imagine how hard that must have been dealing with all those all those issues whilst dealing with a pandemic and, and everything else. So, you know, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, Sutomu, wh what about you? What are you doing? Well, I think uh, the importance is uh, not only to empower women in Japan, but also to empower younger generations in Japan. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, in Japan, I think sexism in Japan is heavily connected with the seniority system. Uh, so both the men, you know, control and dominate everything, uh, especially in politics. 
So, uh, and uh, when you see uh, the, uh, the current situation after pandemic and COVID, uh, those who have suffered are not only uh, women, but also younger generations who cannot attend schools, who cannot, you know, or get uh, telework, uh, communications, uh, education, because you know not all of the Japanese students get uh, you know uh, personal PCs, so they are just you know left behind, no no education at all for some time, and uh, we we have to empower those younger generations who should who should be uh, the promoters to to change for the better in the society. So. Uh, uh, that's important, and uh, because of the demographics, uh, those younger generation's voices are not heavy at this moment. Uh, and then uh, we have to uh, shift more voices to those younger generations. Uh, we, we cannot change the society. And as a conventional media, we are mainly communicating with older generations as leaders, but uh, through uh, reporting on these issues, uh, especially on SDGs, these are the key uh, agenda uh, which can connect with those younger generations and with uh, you know media uh, outlets. So well, through those uh, reports and through those issues, uh, we can communicate with uh, younger generations and younger audience, and we can get uh, we can listen to their voices and we can uh, promote their uh, you know initiatives and we can uh, work together with them. Uh, then that's a key key to change the society. Absolutely. Well said. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Val Bonner. Um, I don't, Florian, how are we doing for time? I've, I've lost track of time. Uh, we have another good six minutes for questions. Okay, cool. I don't even know what day or time it is in a pandemic. No one knows, right? No one knows what the time is. Uh, and I, and I, I know you're in Japan, so I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to you know, stop you going from, to sleep or anything. I know it's quite late for you over there, so do let us know if it's too late. Um, We've got a question here from uh, Val Bonner who says, it's very nice to see so many initiatives focus only on women in news, but aren't we risking to create the opposite of what we're aiming to do? So media for women only and media for men only. Does this approach show that the efforts to mainstream gender throughout the media are just not welcomed? Um, what, what, that's that's actually quite an interesting question. And that's, I, I think there is, there is something in that actually, because sometimes I'm not saying about Bonnie you're being resistant, but I have had that resistance in the newsroom sometimes where you you have some people say, no, 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 we don't want to do that. You know, we can't do that because that's like you're separating people and you're and you're polarizing people and you know it's news for all. And obviously, you know, I think I think I generally disagree with that. I think you have to look at storytelling in different ways. You have to look at your retention and your numbers and you have to look at why certain people are not coming to you and you have to adapt. You know, so uh, that's an interesting question. So actually, I want to go first to Disha on that. Um, what do you What do you think about that? Um, I think that it's a question that we get a lot, and it's a question that I uh, we first off by saying that we we're cre we're an all women newsroom that's creating uh, content by default for men who are you know poles apart from us and it's a very stimulating kind of engagement with the audience because there's a intense degree of trolling that happens and an intense degree of pushback uh, because how dare we you know um, and so um, and it's also um, because what's at the at the fulcrum I think of the model is is hyper local reporting and so actually um, in in, in contrast to a lot of the digital newsrooms, which tend to be quite polarized in terms of their audience, that they're reaching out either to a left-leaning or a right-leaning or a particular age group of audience and so on, we actually have a, a very diverse kind of audience because they're, they're interested in knowing what the news from their village or their district is and no one else is reporting it. So we tend to have a lot of ideological diversity and it's only recently when we've diversified from news reporting to more opinions and more shows and you know feminist content and poking fun at certain structures that we've got you know oh but you know these people seem a little bit less um palatable than we thought they were um but actually it's 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 refreshing, I think, for that audience to have this content because they don't get it anywhere else. They don't they don't hear uh, women as sources of news. For example, when we cover elections, no one talks to women. I mean, maybe more recently now you'll have people parachuting in and speaking to 
a couple of village women to say, you know, who are you going to vote for? But um, otherwise, women and, and the poor are not important sources of news. And so people in this region get to see um, their neighbors and their politicians as, you know, important sources of news. And so that becomes quite, you know, a, a valid and credible. So, um, no, I think that it's it's actually it's actually still such a minuscule proportion of the content that we get fed or the audience gets fed that it doesn't really end up polarizing or alienating an audience. It's it's actually making that audience think differently, which is the point of good media, I think. Yeah. Um, so, Thomas, what, what about you? I mean, does that does this come up in your newsroom do you do you come across an editor who says no 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 we don't want to be doing that you know i think that that's one of the major reasons why we have to declare uh, the declaration of on you know human equality because gender equality because then uh this is clearly show this clearly shows that that declaration is a kind of company policy line so uh, even all the uh, you know traditional thinking uh, editors have to think about that and at the same time, this declaration, uh, we uh, try to uh, make our own efforts to promote more women in a senior position. At this moment, we have uh, out of 20% of female workers, we put only maybe 12% on a senior position. But uh, uh, by in 10 years, by 2030, we have to uh, make it double, uh, at least uh, double uh, the numbers of female senior position uh, managers and, and, and editors. Then uh, those combining, you know, uh, mindset, changing mindset, and also uh, uh, then put more promotion on uh, women on senior positions. That I, I believe that will change uh, for the better. Um, thank you for that, uh, Emily. You're in the midst of a global pandemic, and you've got one of the most polarizing U.S. elections in history. And we've got a question about polarization. So. I think it's very apt. We saw what happened in the last election with with this issue. So I just want to finish off with you. Um, what what what's the solution here? Because it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my take on that is in the United States at least, but I'd I'd offer globally the news is already gendered. It's male, right? Like um, you know, in the United States, we know that more than seventy percent of politics and policy editors and reporters are men. Almost all of them are white men. Um, you know, there are hardly any uh, top newsroom leaders, truly like the CEO or editor in chief of major national or regional newspapers. We are a tiny fraction of the whole. Um, so I think the news is already gendered. So I actually think uh, more platforms like the Nineteenth are working to level the playing field, um, not not to sort of be just for women. Um, the other thing that I think is is important about organizations like ours is that we give all of our journalism away to, for free to every other news organization in the country. So in the U.S. right now, 260 regional newspapers are running our stories. And I don't care if the readers of those publications know that those stories come from the 19th. Uh, in fact, maybe it's better if they don't, because I want men reading those stories. Men are a, uh, a critical piece of the gender equality equation. Uh, equation. Um, so for us, it's about free distribution. It's about, you know, uh, trying to reach a diverse audience. We talk about gender even more than we talk about women because we want to be um, inclusive in those conversations. And yeah, I mean, it's time to level the playing field. Um, women should be writing their own stories. Well, on, on that note, I don't even know what else to end on. I'm not even going to say anything. Um, I, I hope I hope the Spark News team are happy with how this conversation went. But I just want to say thank you really quickly to Emily, Disha, and Sutomo, who can now go to sleep. Um, it's been a really interesting chat, and you guys have been brilliant. So thank you so much for contributing and telling us all this. And I hope we can all keep in touch in some form. I, I, I didn't know, but if you click on chat and people's names, their emails come up, which is amazing. So this is a great way, and I hope the conversation continue in, in some form. And if you're ever in London and the pandemic ends, please come and see us at the BBC. Um, I'll, I'll hand over now to the Spark News team. Ravin, thank you so much for hosting brilliantly this uh, roundtable. Uh, thank you so much for Emily, Disha and Sutumu for uh, taking the time to discuss with us and share your insights and knowledge and experience. Uh, it's been so enlightening for us uh, and I'm sure that the, the public really enjoyed it because there's been a lot of uh, interaction on the chat. 
Uh, so we'll close this inspiring session with remarks from Rebecca Zosmer, Director of Knowledge and Operations, and Molly Shimhanda, Manager of Knowledge and Research at Women in News. They will be popping up magically as usual um, in a few seconds. Uh, Florian is working on it. Um, in the meantime, don't hesitate to share with us your questions on the chat. Uh, Rebecca, you are there. Perfect. Hi, Hi Rebecca. Molly. Nice to meet you. Nice Molly. to meet you. Thank you so much Hi, for everyone. coming. Um, so just uh, as a reminder, we have about 10 minutes uh, and then I'll come back to kind of close the session and, and uh, finish off. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Anissa. Well, um, yes, I'm Rebecca Zausma and I'm based in the UK and I'm joined by my colleague Molly Chamanda based in Zimbabwe. Um, we work for One for Women in News, where we have a simple but uh, complex and challenging mission to increase gender equality in the media industry. And this very much includes our news content. Um, and it's worth mentioning that we have a very regional focus. Um, the majority of our activities um, are in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Arab region. Uh, but we do draw very much um, on global experiences and breast practices best practices. Um, and it's just such, a, it's such an honor today to be wrapping up this session um, and quite honestly, a real breath of fresh air to be talking about um, coming up with concrete solutions to the gender crisis in news content and to hear about some of the successful initiatives in action. So in the spirit of finding these concrete solutions, we thought we'd share some of our recent insights and approaches at WIN. So uh, to kick off, we'll give a quick overview of what WIN has been doing holistically to tackle the problem of gender inequality in content. In terms of public resources, we have a gender balance guide for the media, which we launched today, which is a practical guide uh, that is online and has a downloadable version for those that might want to use it. We also train and provide support to media professionals as well as media organizations to get them to be more gender balanced. This year, we've done it through an online module that we developed, again, a very practical action-oriented focus with this module. And we also do our own monitoring and tracking of content in English and Arabic and have developed a methodology to do this. We go beyond tracking just sources uh, and we work with participants to identify problem areas, change behaviors, and then see the difference. We're currently manually tracking and monitoring, but we hope to have a version of an online automated tracking tool in the few months to follow. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, so that's what um, we're doing at WIN, um, and you're all very welcome to reach out to us if you're interested to find out more. And it's really great timing because, yes, today we've launched our digital um, gender balance guide. Um, and as Molly said, it's very practical, um, but it's also sort of an appeal from us as well to if you have tips you want to share, if you know of um, other initiatives uh, that are exciting and you think should be showcased, please do contact us and let us know because this is supposed to be a growing resource and you know, as more and more solutions come up, we want to be using those solutions. Um, so we thought we'd now shift the focus to look, um, to do sort of a roundup of the solutions that we um, as Women in News sort of global organization are seeing and where there are gaps. And to do that, we actually also need to drill down into what we um, think are the reasons why exactly we have this gender crisis in the news and why it continues. Um, but on a positive, let's start on a positive note. On a positive note, um, we're definitely seeing an increase in tracking and research. And this means that we have very, um, useful and hard evidence that we have a problem. Um, and so we're seeing the sort of increase in research um, at the general level. Um, so for example, you know, ACAS and who makes the news, but we're also seeing initiatives like Prognosis and Gender Equality Tracker who are publicly holding media to account. Um, and then we're also seeing organizations holding themselves to account and BBC 5050 has done a huge amount um, in this field. So kudos to them. What we're not seeing um, in terms of the data is regional data. And so at WIN, we're trying very hard to plug that data gap because we found that um, if the data is not relevant, it doesn't speak to organizations in those regions. Um, so it's not just about regions, it's also about language. Um, and this is a big problem. We have like a very major focus on the English language and we're not really looking at other languages. 
Um, so in terms of solutions, more of what we have <laughs> at the moment, um, let's use what is the, I mean, BBC 5050 is such a great approach, um, but we need more research in other regions and we need this research to be, to be shared. On a less positive note, <laughs> we're seeing still really limited awareness about why gender balance content matters. Um, so the moral argument is really strong but the business case just isn't as strong. And it's not because it doesn't exist, it does. It's because there's limited research and because we really need organizations who are proactively and intentionally trying to engage a female audience um, through more gender balanced content to show that this is having an impact on their business models and it's having a positive impact on the business models and an impact on their revenue as well. And in our um, digital guide, um, we have an example of a media in Sweden. It was really hard to find this example. Um, and it's a great example and it shows that correlation. But we need to make this business case um, stronger and we need other organizations to be contributing, you know, what they what they know on this in this area. That's right. Um, and the fact that organizations are not seeing the financial benefits of gender balanced content leads to a lack of will. It also uh, goes down to a lack of resources though. Um, at the organizational level, they're competing business priorities. So if there's no proven link to increased revenues, then making content gender balanced is considered as not being worth it. And this year more than ever, this has been a problem, particularly in the regions that we have been working in. So we encourage that there be strategies and support for organizations, which include committing resources, human and otherwise, towards addressing gender balance and content. And our gender balance guide provides strategies for organizations and how they can be better able to do this. We cannot expect media organizations to do this on their own. So offering practical solutions and working together with them to implement these is the way to go. Exactly. And um, where there is actually will and knowledge, because you know, a lot of the time there is. Um, a lot of organizations are, are making the mistake and, and making the assumption that hiring more women automatically leads to gender balanced content through this miraculous trickle down effect. Um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, bringing in a diversity of uh, voices um, and more women is fantastic. And yes, it will contribute to more diverse content and it will and women are less likely to stereotype, but it doesn't mean that they don't know that they are stereotyping. It doesn't mean that they know how to be gender balanced because a lot of us have grown up in patriarchal societies and it's very much part of us and who we are and how we frame and understand the world. So organizations, please, please, please do hire more women. Um, that's just fundamental, but don't stop there and assume that that's just going to solve the gender balance content problem. Exactly. And on our part as media professionals, our innate and unconscious biases as humans also come into play. So whether we are women or men, we are unconsciously biased and partly because we are born this way and partly we're shaped by the societies that we grow up in. And it's very difficult to change behavior if we don't know or cannot acknowledge that we are unconsciously biased then we purposely need to explore these biases, acknowledge that they exist, and be able to call ourselves out on them. Um, in such a case, uh, expertise and resources to help individuals work through their own unconscious biases should be offered. And again, a willingness to acknowledge that we are unconsciously biased is a good step forward. Yeah, and this sort of segues into the fact that there's just a general lack of knowledge um, about what it means to be gender balanced um, and what we can practically do to make our content more balanced, it's both for organizations and individuals as well. Um, so much of the time we are in, yes, we want, we want to, but we just don't know how. Um, and part of the problem is we're focusing very much just on sources as an industry, uh, which is a fantastic start and it makes sense, but it's just not a problem with just sources, it's subjects, it's mentions, it's authors, it's language. And we need multiple solutions to address these issues. Um, and when we've developed a framework, which we find really helpful um, internally, it's helped frame our trainings. Um, and it's just a sort of a four pillar framework and you'll see it repeated in our digital guide. Um, and it's about uh, the four things are prominence. So is there equal prominence of women? Are their voices and opinions equal? Are they being portrayed in an equal way? That's very much about language. 
um, and is the content accessible to women? So there's this full part for it, and we find it extremely helpful, and I hope it's really helpful um, for you as well. But essentially, we need to be putting an emphasis um, on training media professionals in all aspects of gender balance, not just representation. And um, we're finding that there are a lack of practical tools and support in several of these four areas that we just mentioned by Rebecca. And also in terms of the use of the resources that do exist. So an example of a resource uh, for sources is Harrow's Help a Reporter and multiple sources have also been um, mentioned in the discussions that we've had. Uh, and organizations in some countries have developed source books specific to women experts alongside training of women experts in media literacy and communication skills so that they can be drawn on as sources. But much of this is also about making these tools and resources regionally relevant because journalists are facing different challenges depending on the context that they are working in. However, there's a really big gap in gender editorial style guides in different languages and monitoring of how these are also used so media professionals need more shared expertise, resources and tools like source books, style guides, and they need to actually be used. Yeah, and just some concluding remarks. I mean, we're a very mixed audience here today, I believe, um, and, and lots of different stakeholders. Um, and the solutions that we need are going to be really different and specific to our own context. Um, but we can't just wait for others to lay the groundwork for us. And while we should applaud the organizations and individuals that are working hard to resolve the gender crisis in news, we must acknowledge that there's much work to do and we have to address the issue at an industry level. What is very clear is that resolving the crisis in our news is not going to happen by itself. What we do has to be purposeful and sustained and it has to be top down and bottom up. Yeah, exactly. And what's more, when we do make those changes and launch those initiatives, especially when they are just wonderfully successful, we need to make sure that they are known about um, and that we make a concerted effort to share best practices, encourage others within the industry to replicate them. And so the sort of our last point is a really big appeal to please, please, please share with us um, any resources, any tips um, and any great initiatives because we are very, at Women in News, we are very committed to making sure that whatever there is out there available is made available to everybody. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Molly, and I will definitely second what you just said, Rebecca. Please share with us uh, your initiatives and what you've been doing in your newsroom. And I also wanted to point out that apparently there are a lot of uh, WIN alumni in the room. Um, and um, Karen was also saying that WIN has been very helpful in mentoring women journalists in efforts to amplify women voices in news content. So thank you so much for your work, both Rebecca and Molly. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers, to Nina, to Lula, to Emily, to Disha, to Raven, to Tsutomu, Rebecca and Molly for such an inspiring talk and conversation. We really hope that you enjoyed it. We at Spark News really enjoyed putting this together and also sharing with you this time. Thank you to all of our participants. You've been great and you've been very interactive. Uh, and I know you've been uh, probably doing a lot of events online and, uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I just need to tell you that we'll be sharing with you a newsletter very soon. Uh, with all of the content recapping from the from the webinar but also sharing your own initiatives are and insights so please do feel free to message us uh, and to email us so we can add all of this information to the newsletter it's been a pleasure discussing with you all i also wanted to thank uh, the gates foundation for the support uh for the, the support sorry that they are bringing for this initiative so don't hesitate to send us the feedback and make sure you don't miss our upcoming session, which will be happening in November uh, on women in leadership. But of course, you'll be getting all of this information uh, in the newsletter next week. Uh, thank you so much and uh, hopefully see you very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.